When the 2020 edition of the Hero Quest game was announced, we were quite curious to know about the miniatures that will come with it. We suspected some changes wouldn't be too drastic, whereas others will need to be considered as IP laws might get in the way of things. I mean, you know, Games Workshop, right? One particular miniature in the game was one of the biggest question marks for all of us. What will happen with the big, mean green things the Fimir wear? And how will we go on to paint them? My name is Miguel, this is Rush the Wash, and on today's video, we're gonna be painting abominations. The abominations in the new Hero Quest are some of the most interesting miniatures in the box. They are very different from what the original game came with. Fimir. The Fimir was an interesting concept born from Irish mythology, the Fomorian. It was rumored that they were discontinued by Games Workshop because they also carried a hefty dose of controversial backstory. If you are not aware of why I say this, the background on Fimir in Warhammer Fantasy role-playing game 1st edition stated that they needed uh, female humans in order to have offspring. And let's be honest, no sane woman or man will be willing to put up with a slimy one-eyed monster that left mud marks on the carpets and floor. Therefore, as explained in the lore, these relationships were non-consensual and even though none of this was mentioned in HeroQuest, monsters like this in a game meant for kids 10 and above was a little bit too much. If that was the case or not, for whatever reason, the Fimir disappeared in the mists of time only to come back many, many years later. Enter the Abominations. They are humanoid fish monsters similar to those that we can find in other media and role-playing games. Although Fimir still have a special place in my heart, I like the new minis with their concept closer to more generic fantasy a la Dungeons and Dragons. Let's paint them. I have six regular Abominations from the base game and Keller's Keep plus two very gnarly ones. It is as if a fishman had unprotected hanky-panky with an octopus infested with barnacles. I like to spice things up, not like that, but and, you know. I do not have any official examples of color schemes like the ones Mike McVeigh, bless be his name, had done for the All Hero Quest. I'm going to paint them in different color schemes using blue, green, and red. Let's get to it. I mentally analyze the minis before starting painting them. This means that I look at the miniature and I start dissecting it and organizing the different sections for painting. These miniatures are something like this. The skin, the scales, the weapons, the clothing, and the small details, which include the eyes, the teeth, claws, and barnacles. Dividing the whole miniature into smaller sections, I can start deciding how I want to paint each one of them. The undertone is what I paint the miniatures with after priming them. And we're gonna paint the largest areas with a base color that is going to be where we build the next one from it. This is the undertone. The terminology can be different for each one of you, but well, the etymology makes sense to me, so I guess I will stick to my guns here. Once that dries, we give another coat, now with a different color. The subtle interaction between the undertone and the color used afterwards will create the final hue, which is going to be green, blue or pink red. For the blue abominations, I use these two different color combinations. And for the green abominations, this. Last, for the pink red ones, I use this. But let's spice it up and call each different color names. This one will be ocean blue, this one is going to be Swamp Green and this one Castlevania Red because it is. With this we have 70% of the mini done, roughly. However, we still need to do some work to get them to look more than acceptable for our games. We want them to pop. Let's paint the scales. This way we can spice it up a little. One good trick if you have a decent pulse and can handle the extra time is to highlight the edges before giving them the next coat glaze. I use pure white for this. And once that dries, we hit the different areas with a glaze of a different color. One thing you can try is volumetric shading by applying a darker color on only one of the sides of the scales. This will accentuate the contrast between light and dark sides and make the result look quite interesting. On my abominations, I wanted to try something else that would make them look more natural. 
Have you ever noticed how frogs and fish have lighter underbellies so predators and prey have a harder time seeing them from beneath? I tried to achieve something similar to that by painting some stripes with white paint on the inside of the hands, the arms, the chest and the belly, and also on the soles of the feet. I also use this to clean the teeth and the eyes as well as the claws, so we just save time by doing this together. After that, I paint the membranes between the spines and the back and the claws and feet with a flesh color, and I glaze the areas I painted with white as well. This works very well with the swamp green abominations. Feel free to try other colors, like, you know, you can paint the underside with a light color like white bone, as this is how nature usually works. All the abominations have a few barnacles and even starfish. If you own the weird abominations, these are the ones, they have a lot of those. I painted the barnacles white. The barnacles are just picked up randomly with agarose dunes, snake bite leather, and grief charged gray and drakenhof nightshade. Whatever. Whatever you got, whatever you got. Both light browns and grays will work fine here. And for those weird tentacles coming out of the barnacles on the special abominations, I highlighted them with white paint lines and then glazed them with purple and green. You can also use agarose dunes or a skeleton horde to pick up the teeth and claws. To up the contrast, you can add a light glaze of watered down snake bite leather to darken the root of both teeth and claws. I especially like the design of the weapons because they have an interesting shape and I want to paint them as if they were made of bronze. A little patina is in order. If you watched my previous video on metals, you probably know what I'm going to do here. After that dried, I gave a light dry brush with a metallic paint, and then I added a final patina with Nihilag Oxide. The same process was used for the belt buckle. Now the shaft of the weapon was painted using Contrast Space Wolf's Grey and Leviathan Blue to give it this dark bluish color. For the loincloth, I also use Space Wolf's Grey and a little bit of extra shading with this blue. I also clean up a little bit later with white. This dark blue is perfect for shading certain areas of the miniatures as it is very dark without being particularly black. There are always a lot of small details that you can work on with a little extra highlights like in this case bleach bone in the barnacles and teeth, a little bit white here and there. I mean, the amount of stuff that you can do on these miniatures is limitless, but it depends on how much time you want to invest in them. One of the most interesting features in the miniatures is the eyes. They are big and googly and obviously a focal point on the miniatures. I started by painting them with Cassandra yellow and drew a red stripe and then a black one. And I finished them off with a couple of white highlights to mimic reflections on them. And the final abominations look like this. Overall, they are miniatures that not only are easy to paint, but also very fun to do so. Monsters tend to be very satisfying to finish, and these guys will do their best to give a scare to my players when they explore the layers of Sargon. You know what you have to do if you enjoyed the video, and if you want more, watch this. My name is Miguel, this is Rush the Wash, and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Un beso, adios.